Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the session Glass Beads in a New Light, uh, which is our last session of the 60th Annual Seminar on Glass on the topic of expanding the histories of glass. Uh, my name is Kate Larson, and I am the Curator of Ancient Glass here at the Corning Museum of Glass in Corning, New York. Um, and I'm joined by three great panelists today, and we'll be discussing in the, over the next hour um, various topics around uh, glass beads and the study of glass beads that we're doing. Uh, as some of you may know, Corning received an NEH grant uh, this year to uh, work on expanding our interpretation of glass beads in, or expanding our interpretation for our 35 centuries of glass gallery, which is our main kind of core of our historical collection. And the curatorial and interpretation team really felt that glass beads were something that were really critically important to the history of glass and had gone understudied and unappreciated and especially kind of under displayed and underutilized in our galleries, though we weren't really telling those stories to our visitors in the way we wanted to. So we're using a big part of that grant to help support the work of two researchers who are working with, who are here with us today, Kristen Landau and Vincent Del Moss. Um, and also support some scientific work and analysis on the study of our glass beads, which will be done by Laura Dusubu. So we'll hear from each of those, each of these folks today about what they're what they've been working on. Um, and we really were hoping that this will be, uh, I've asked each of them to speak for about five to seven minutes, um, uh, just talking a little bit about the work they've been doing, because we really want this to be a discussion um, in the last half hour or so. So um, we have some questions that we want to talk about, but you know, we'll welcome questions through chat and Q&A as well. So without further ado, um, we'll start with Dr. Vincent Delmas. Based in Montreal, Vincent is a Canadian archaeologist, anthropologist, and scuba diver, specializing in material culture from the 16th to the 20th century and in naval architecture. He has conducted archaeological research both land and underwater throughout the Quebec province in Canada. Vincent. Hi, everyone. So today I'm going to, so I have the chance, uh, thanks to Kate to, uh, and the Corning Museum to be, uh, to, to do a research about the West African collection they have. So, um, so you have in the first uh, picture here, uh, like a review, uh, a summary of what you may find. So uh, mostly, you know, some uh, glass powder beads, but uh, the core of the collection, it's more about uh, European glass beads, uh, mostly uh, Venetian. So we can go to the next picture, please. So yeah, I gotta move my, yeah. So, um, so the collection, so summary orientation and uh, a very quick overview. So we have almost like um, 1000 entries. So one, 1000 numbers and uh, recently, so I went, go, I went through it and it's almost, you have almost like uh, 13,000 beads. They were mainly acquired by Alastair Lamb, uh, a British anthropologist and um, part-time archaeologist in the 1970s. So the assessment of the collection is very important. Uh, is it, is it, is it, it is the most comprehensive one for West Africa. Uh, the materials, uh, it's about uh, 95, but maybe um, more, maybe 98 uh, percent is European glass. And the timeline is, um, maybe 5% of the collection is the 16th century and the rest, like 90, uh, it's between the end of the 19th century to the 20th century. And for the interpretation, it's very important because uh, glass beads, you know, in Africa, uh, like most of the African tribes uh, before, you know, the colonization, they didn't need any money. Uh, they don't have like money that we have, but the beads, um, and the bead making, it was part of the trade because they were like currency. And uh, beads were e easy to travel as well. And it was very important uh, as a social, as a rite of passage, because beads means, you know, uh, you can have beads during your birth, uh, during, you know, uh, different um, uh, passage in life, and uh, you can be buried with them. So we can go next, please. So uh, as you can see here, uh, I guess I said before, 95% uh, of the glass uh, are from you know, Italy, Bohemia, Holland, Germany, and African made. So as you can see here, uh, so the, the, um, the red dots uh, on the right, 
uh, it's about you know the place uh, where Alastair Lamb and other people working from the Corning they um, retrieve the beads. So it's mostly uh, nowadays Ghana, Mauritania, Nigeria, and you have some in the north in Morocco. So as you can see here, I place you know the most ancient ones, so from the 16th century, 17th century. Um, it's a bit part of the collection. It's not most the the big part of the collection. Um, just to show that they have as well a very ancient ones. So we can go to the next, please. But the core, as I said before, um, of the collection, like maybe eighty percent, it is you know, uh, Mille Fiori, Chevron, and lamp work beads. As you can see here, uh, some example. So the big part of the collection is that. Uh, so it's maybe like um, late 19th century or early 20th century. And it was very important because the color, the pattern, uh, they were very cherished in West, in West Africa as well. So we can go to the next. Thank you. You know, but before, you know, uh, glass uh, appeared uh, in Africa, wherever. You know, uh, African were making beads at their own as well. So you have as well in the same collection, it was very interesting to see beside the glass that we have as well different kind of material like ceramic, coconut shell, seeds. Uh, you have stone beads as well, uh, etc. And you have as well like um, some alloy and you have shells. Um, we can go to the next, please. So here, um, the collection they have in the Corning Museum is essentially glass powder bead making. So how can you make this kind of beads? So you can see in the, in the bottom here, you can see what the ends. So basically these kind of beads, they were using sand, crush and recycle bottles. It can be as well like glass from the windows and they were using beads as well. They were using beads in many ways. They are crushing beads, but as you can see in that model here, the specimen here, they can reuse the beads inside the beads. So the glass powder bead making, it's still made in Ghana mainly, but it was before in Mauritania as well, all the West part of Africa. So they were using, yeah, as you can see, the necklace on the, on the right, using basically uh, mainly yellow color. They were crushing, as you can see, and they put them in, um, in mold, as you can see as well. So think like, how can you make glass powder bead? It's like, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, you know, like a sand painting, or, you know, when you put uh, some sand into a bottle, it's, it's kind of the same principle. And then you have, the, so you have the core, and then you have the exterior, mainly uh, yellow. And then you can add, as you can see, different kind of pattern, different kind of decoration. Uh, next picture, please. So here, I just summarized uh, one of the most significant, sorry, and uh, one of the most important piece they have uh, in the museum. So uh, starting from here, so from Ghana, you have that we call bottom and akosobits. So um, for West African, so they were made in West Africa from European glass. So you can see uh, the different kind. Then you have in Mauritania as well made of glass powder beads, uh, this kind of beads. And from Nigeria, you have wound beads. So like the same technique they were using uh, in Italy, like in the 19th century in Venice, like uh, putting a, um, a piece of glass and just uh, wire it around the core. So, so you have the, I can see, I, I can show you here the main uh, African beads we have in the Korean Museum. And their significance is very important. I think maybe we're going to talk about it later, but mostly, you know, all the pattern you can see. So here you have, uh, you can see eyes on the beads so to protect against the evil eye. Um, some of the, the symbol means something. We, we are not quite yet there to figure it out, but I'm going to try maybe to answer a question later, but there is avenue of research we can do like in the textile, in the culture. We, 
if we want to to uh, understand this collection better we we must you know be into the anthropological end to assess as well and to ask to uh, actual african beat makers to understand more um so next please so uh so you can see in a way as a, as a thank you uh, it was fast i'm sorry for that but you can see that uh beautiful african woman you can see um uh most all the necklace you can see we have example in the corning museum so you can see it's a way of express femininity and status as well you can see as well like i told you before that the yellow color the golden color very very important for african and west african uh it's sim it symbolizes power rank and you can see as well uh, on this lady so thank you everyone thanks vincent and yes and i know it's just scratching the surface <laughs> of what you are uh, what you've been uh, studying and learning so um next we'll hear from Kristen landau dr Kristen landau is an anthropological archaeologist specializing in political economy urbanism and material culture her past work deciphered political dynamics in the ancient Maya city of Copan, Honduras, through the excavation of households within an urban neighborhood. The close analysis of common taken for granted artifacts has led her to focus on the items of everyday life, women's work and bottom up histories. Kristen. Can you all hear me? Okay. Hi everybody. <clears throat> and thank you for being here. Um, I was tasked with analyzing the beads from Corning's collection from, from Southeast Asia, including multiple different countries. Um, as Kate mentioned, I'm an anthropological archaeologist, meaning I do archaeological work and study material things, but from an anthropological or holistic study of humanity uh, perspective. From what I've seen in other sessions here, I think it's a little bit of a different orientation both that Vincent and I have toward these beads. But uh, yeah, my past work has been in a very different region of the world in a different time period. So it's been exciting to uh, get to know this, this area. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, having Vincent and I study these world regions that are more marginalized in history and in the study of glass. And with beads is a really notable endeavor that, that Corning is embarking on. And I'm excited to see them included in this new exhibit. <clears throat> uh, so this first slide is uh, a few general pictures. You'll see these again of uh, typical beads from the Southeast Asian region. Uh, a mixture of mostly monochrome or mostly singular colored beads uh, made in primarily two different ways. And then on the, the right hand side, some fancy stuff. Um, okay, next slide, please. So on the left here is a map of where um, beads have been located. Um, from the Corning's collections where they were collected by primarily Alistair Lamb, same as Vincent's collection from, from West Africa. Um, when, I, when I started my analysis, spending three weeks in Corning, um, there were, I believe, 148-ish records. Um, we weren't sure how many beads, but we now know there's there's 152 records and that might expand depending on how we categorize things in the, in the final uh, versions. Uh, um, and over 26,000 individual beads. So it's, it's been a lot. Um, about half of our beads in this pie chart, if you can see that font down there in this pie chart uh, are from Malaysia. So um, I wish I had a mouse pointer, but uh, South of Thailand, <laughs> uh, Malaysia. Um, and most beads from Malaysia are from these two archeological sites, which is especially exciting for me. It sounds like they were actually collected um, from excavations uh, in the 60s and, and 70s. And so part of my research has been going back to, to, to excavate 
the old records of the excavation project to learn more about how these beads came to light. And then about a quarter of the beads are from India, from famous from the famous bead making site of Ritham Medu and Indonesia, and then just a few from Vietnam, Thailand, and some places that we don't quite know yet. Um, okay, go ahead. Next slide. So I've been focused on production techniques primarily. How were these beads made and what can we say about them based on the way that they were made? And there were two major ways that, that beads from this area were made and, and distinction to what Vincent said, um, most beads here were either made from this drawn technique or a wound technique. Um, this drawn technique, as I've written on the slide here, um, is, is pulling the glass in a long tube. And what I really love <clears throat> is how you can see the striations in the glass itself. So you can, you can see the history of, you can see how things were made in the past. And so you're looking at history when you look at the bead. So that's the, that's the, the drawn method. And then you would snip and make beads. And then the wound method, I think most people, are, more people are probably familiar with winding it around a mandrel. This is what I've seen in all the demonstrations at Cording um, uh, to create the bead. On the left-hand side here, particularly interesting, um, I have been calling these candy wrapper beads because they have, they're, they're more formally called collared beads. Um, so they have these collars, but they also, you know, in light of Halloween coming up, they also kind of look like candy wrappers, right? Um, trying to figure out where these were made because they're, pre they're pretty um, unique. So understanding, um, um, I see someone laughing, understanding uh, their origin can help us trace how they moved around in Southeast Asia. Um, okay, next, please. But we also see, like Vincent showed, um, these mosaic or millefiori technique beads. And we actually, in Corning, have a few examples, and this is really cool, and I think something that would be great to have on exhibit um, of, of the different pieces of how a mosaic bead is made. So on the left-hand side, you see the final product. So you have the bead, and then you have all of these decorations. You have a face, a portrait, a swan, and then on the, the bottom right, you can kind of see maybe a flowering tree, something like this. On the far right is the cane that was used to make the impressions on the bead. And then in the middle, you see um, tiny little pieces of that cane cut up. So this is actually uh, an example of a modern made bead in, in 2010 or 2011, um, imitating ancient beads. So it gives us a sense, this is um, an archeology, span we would call this experimental archeology. span How were these things made? And uh, can we reproduce how they were made in the past to understand something more about the process of production? Okay, you can go ahead to the next slide, please. So as I said, I focus mostly on beads from two archeological sites in Malaysia. And uh, something that's, uh, that I really like from, from these Malaysian beads is, is just their, their coloration. They're very um, bright, mostly again, monochrome, um, reds, oranges, yellows, turquoise, blues, greens, black too. Um, but we also find beads made out of ceramic, uh, there's one bead that Corning has that might be made out of um, a vertebra from a fish. And then on the top right, you see uh, beads made out of semi-precious stones too. On the left-hand side, um, these are, are some interesting interlinked that I, I've called them beads where it looks like there's two wound beads that have been interlinked like a chain um, and then each bead is, is one segment of the chain. Um, and there seems to be some discussion in, in the literature and among experts about where these were 
made and used. And so this is something that I've been particularly interested in getting to the bottom of. Um, and, and Laura, who will talk next, uh, we're hoping to analyze these beads and, and understand the chemical composition of them uh, to, to um, figure out where they were made and how they were distributed. Um, next slide, please. And then, of course, we have some fancy cool beads. Uh, the, the top image, the top right image here, um, seems to be glass beads imitating semi-precious stones. Uh, and you can see um, my chewed up fingernail with the, with the green bead. You can see the line right there showing that it was a mold press bead. And then those two ivory color beads are actually meant to um, imitate human molar teeth. So that's interesting and, and different. Um, and were likely produced for consumption, for use by populations who wore perhaps actual human molar teeth. So it's telling us something a little bit about um, the significance and, and use of these beads. And then we have some perhaps gold foil beads um, in the two images on the left here where um, gold foil was, was uh, inlaid and then covered in, in yellow colored glass to make it bright and shiny. Um, and then there's some beads where we're just not sure, were they, were they glass or clay? Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll get to the bottom of this question too with uh, that chemical analysis. Um, but yeah, so this is an overview, um, some of the interesting and uh, like I said, more mundane everyday life examples of beads that tell us more than we might think about ancient people. Thank you. Thanks, Kristen. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's both Vincent and Kristen's work has just shown us the, the richness of what we have in the collection and the um, that was largely gathered in the 60s and 70s, as they indicated. Um, and so the opportunity to kind of take this time now in the 2020s and study this material in new ways and using all the new techniques and information that's available to us. Um, it's really, really exciting. And uh, I know your work's really just um, in its infancy. So um, and speaking of new techniques, um, our last speaker, last panelist today uh, is Dr. Lord Dusubu, who is a senior research scientist at the Field Museum and a chemist specializing in the determination of the compositions of ancient artifacts made from synthesized or natural glass, as well as metals and stones. She obtained her PhD in chemistry from the University of Orléans in France in 2001 with a dissertation dealing with the use of mass spectrometry, spectrometry excuse me, to study the provenance and the circulation of ancient glass beads around the Indian Ocean. Prior to her current appointment, she was postdoctoral fellow at the Smithsonian Institution where she developed the application of mass spectrometry for ancient gold characterization and the use of portable X-ray fluorescence to survey cultural artifacts. Since 2004, she's managed the elemental analysis facility at the Field Museum, and she pursues research on ancient glass around the Indian Ocean and beyond. Laura, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. So my name is Laura Dussibieu, and as a uh, uh, Kate told you, I work at the Field Museum uh, and there I'm responsible of a lab uh, that is specialized in determining the elemental composition of ancient materials. So I'm a chemist uh, and I work with colleagues that are archaeologists and are interested in understanding the technology, use and circulation of artifacts such as ceramics, metal implements or glass objects. And among these glass objects, beads are at the center of my personal research. The next slide, please. I started uh, 25 years ago with a study of glass beads uh, that were a little more than 2,000 years old, found in Sri Lanka. I used laser ablation, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, or LAICPMS to determine the composition of these beads. It's a technique that presents several advantages. It is able to measure almost all the elements uh, present in the bead, the major and minor elements that are present in rather high quantities, 
and the trace elements that are present in very small quantities. And we will see uh, a little uh, later in the next slide uh, exactly why we are interested in all those different elements. Also, what is very important is that this technique is uh, what we call quasi non-destructive. That means that uh, we are uh, able to sample objects uh, that we want to analyze by uh, drilling a hole in the object with a laser beam that has a diameter of maximum 100 microns, which is roughly the diameter of one of your hair. So when we are done, uh, the damage at the surface of the object is invisible to the naked eye. Um, so next slide, please. So why do we want to obtain the composition of glass beads? What we want to know uh, is the glass recipes that was used because glass recipes were different uh, based on the region and the time period. So by knowing the glass recipe, we can also learn about technology used in the past. We can sometimes have relative dating of the object, object and also uh, we can reconstruct ancient uh, exchange networks. And as you can see on this uh, slide, um, I consider even some people might have different opinion uh, that there are three main uh, ingredients that are necessary to make ancient glass. Uh, first, uh, there is glass, ancient glass is silica based. So we need uh, a silica based ingredient that usually is either sand or uh, quartz pebbles or silica rich pebbles uh, that then would be crushed. And of course, they don't uh, just bring silica uh, to the glass batch. There are um, a range of other elements such as aluminum, iron, uh, that are also present. And that if we measure their concentration in the glass, we can tell if it's uh, that type of sand or if it's uh, rather pure quartz, uh, rather pure silica uh, source um, or ingredient that was used. Um, this um, silica source also bring a trace element that will be uh, characteristic of the geological environment of the of the sand of the silica rich ingredient, and that can also tell us about. Um, the provenance from a region rather than a, another region. So silica uh, is um, very hard to melt. The um, melting point of silica is uh, too high for traditional uh, glass making furnace. So usually um, glass maker add a flux, uh, which basically is an alkali or alkali rich ingredient. So it can be um, either um, a, so a sodium or um, potassium rich ingredient from mineral origin or obtained from um, the ashes of plant or trees. And here also the composition will tell us exactly the nature of the flux and trace elements, those elements that are present in small quantity, usually we consider trace element when the concentration in the glass is below 0.1%, will tell us about um, maybe the uh, geological um, environment where um, the plants that were used as a flux uh, grew uh, or will help us at locating um, uh, the flux where it was taken from. And uh, lastly, uh, to change the appearance of the glass, the glass maker use uh, colorant and they are usually um, oxide or salt of um, metal metallic element. And when we find um, a higher concentration of one of these elements in the glass, we can usually connect color and coloring ingredient. And uh, here also, Trace element can be very useful um, to um, locate the origin of some uh, colorant. Doesn't it's not always easy, but um, that uh, can be um, that can be uh, useful for us to know uh, trace element connected to ingredients such as colorant. Next slide, please. 
So using the elemental composition of glass, I studied glass beads from different regions. And here I will specifically talk about my research around the Indian Ocean, um, where one of the major uh, region for um, one of the major place for glass uh, making and um, glass bead production is India. With several colleagues in the US and in India, we looked at the elemental and the isotopic composition of sand uh, collected in India to try to identify in which region of India glass was made by comparing um, with elemental and isotopic composition of um, the different glasses we think were manufactured in India. So we compare glass composition and sand composition and see if we have matches. And another part of my research around the Indian Ocean is uh, tracking the different Indian glass types um, around this region because it's telling us about um, trade network and also it can help us with uh, chronology. Um, um, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. I'm also, <laughs> sorry, I'm also interested in um, uh, European trade glass beads uh, that can be found in North America and in Africa. Uh, they were produced during the modern period in Europe, and most of the information we have about them were collected for materials uh, from um, beads found outside Europe. So I'm currently focusing my attention about the glass beads that uh, are found in France during the modern period with the idea to have a better understanding of glass manufacturing and glass trade within France. Uh, next slide, please. So to finish this presentation, I just would like to show you this um, last slide with three bits that are red and very similar. They are shaped the same way and they were likely manufactured in the same workshop. Um, but looking at their composition, uh, we realized that two of them have a composition characteristic of some glass made um, in Central Asia. I think if we move forward one more slide, here we go. Um, and uh, the bead in the middle has a composition characteristic of Southern India. So that is something we couldn't have been able to tell without analyzing, analyzing sorry, the beads. And uh, this is showing the complexity of uh, glass and gla glass bead trade in ancient time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. Um, I mean, speaking for myself, I, I think the scientific analysis that's been happening on beads in the last 10, 20 years has just really um, transformed our understanding about the way these objects moved and circulated uh, in antiquity and in the modern period as well. Um, so it's really exciting. Um, and we're really glad to have the use of <laughs> your, uh, your lab to understand our material in Corning better. Um, so I, I want to start with a question for all of us to discuss. We talked, we really focused, focused a lot on the beads um, themselves as sort of material objects. Um, but of course, those beads represent people. And what we study is archaeologists and as museum curators and as anthropologists is trying to understand people and what they were doing and why they were doing it. So for the sort of areas that you're looking at, the areas that you're looking at beads on, um, what's the significance of beads to the people who made, traded, used them? I don't know who wants to start. Mm -hmm. Vincent, you sort of, oh, Kristen unmuted. Vincent, you sort of alluded to this a little bit in your presentation. Do you want to start about kind of what the meaning of beads was to yeah, folks? And you can. Yeah. Uh, so the significance, but there is many significance, but for uh, maybe for for Africa, uh, I mean, like I said before, um, since African, you know, they have no need for money. Uh, beads was very easy, you know when you want to uh and it's easy to trade for uh pine oil ivory gold and slave sadly but so it was uh very significant and uh especially like i told before about the ghana and mauritania uh beads where you know the symbols about the beads like uh, 
um, the rituals of birth, uh, coming of age, so the woman, especially, uh, marriage or death, they were very significant. So, yeah. To build on a little bit of what Vincent's saying, um, anthropologically, to understand the significance of an, of an object or a class of objects, um, I've in my head understood things as an economic value and then social or cultural value. And so Vincent hit on economic values, beads as, as money or um, as Marx might say, an exchange value or how much uh, labor went into something determines how much it's valued. Uh, not always, sometimes. Um, Personally, I think the, the social and cultural side of, of, of value and significance is more interesting. What did the beads mean uh, for the people who were wearing them? And what did they signify for the people seeing them wear these beads? And this could be really anything, education, social class, race, ethnic identity, gender, age, marriage status. Um, and these are the, the questions that I'm grappling with for Southeast Asia, and, and it's, it was probably different in every society in every different country, right? It's, it's a large world area, but the people were, were all different and unique. Um, and this is something that I'm hoping maybe any listeners here can, can chime in about afterward. Uh, if, if you have insights about the meaning of these beads for modern day people, um, and what you're interested in, and that would help direct my research for Southeast Asia. I will add something that uh, is a little uh, an indirect answer to your question. I'm a chemist, so um, that's, an, uh, that's an aspect that uh, I find interesting, but I'm not uh, always very well equipped to, uh, to deal with. Um, but what I wanted to say is that um, looking at what I call Indian beads that you can find all over the Indian Ocean and beyond. Uh, very interestingly, um, my colleagues uh, in France found uh, a lot of them in French graves and uh, in graves of other uh, country in Western Europe. And they were really puzzled by that because uh, so that was um, in graves from the Merovingian area, so fourth, uh, sixth century AD. And they were wondering why those beats are coming from so far away when <laughs> I'm sure there were bits available um, in France. And what they realize is uh, they found them in burials, in graves. And uh, the bit seems to be arranged in a way that uh, suggests that they were soon, uh, they were attached to uh, garment. So uh, in this case, uh, maybe people uh, didn't see the bit first, but saw the garment, maybe the fabric, uh, maybe they were. Uh, interested by the decoration, the fact to put all those bits together. Uh, and maybe that's why they were interested in uh, acquiring those, um, those garments. If you look in Southeast Asia, there are a lot of bits from uh, burials, and it seems that they were more used as a, a personal ornament, uh, bracelet, um, they are found around the neck. So, of that was a different approach, right? They were not looking at beads the same way in France and uh, and in Southeast Asia. Um, so yeah, that's what I wanted to add to the discussion. Thanks, Laura. I'm, I'm going to read a comment that we received in chat um, from Carrie Sananen, who has been partially looking at the role of uh, beads in transatlantic slave exchange. And she comments that I think it's really important to place the exchange of beads in West Africa as being outside of a capitalist system that worked very differently. It was the transatlantic slave trade that brought racial capitalism to West Africa. And these were two very different systems in play. And then she notes that the slave trade was set up to overwhelmingly deliver profit to Europe at the cost of African people's lives, labor and systems, which is of course, certainly a dynamic that's happening throughout the uh, 16th or 19th century. So thanks, Carrie. Um, I think in that sort of, in that vein, well, actually we'll do a quick, I think this could be a little, a quick, quick easy question for Laura. Um, knowing the fragility of ancient glass, um, do you have problems with breaking beads or shattering beads when you do the analysis on them? Oh, no, that just never happened. And thinking they are fragile is sometime over. 
um, well, I work on those Indian beads, and I can tell you they look as new. Mm. It really depends on the composition of the of the glass. Uh, people working on a medieval uh, plantage glass that have low concentration of silica has a hard time, you know, getting things not uh, falling into dust. But um, but a lot of beads are just really sturdy and they look as new. So um, we, I don't think we ever, we have ever broken anything <laughs> studying, <laughs> you know, if it's too fragile anyway, we won't want to touch it because anything would break it. But the analysis itself, it's just making a tiny hole and nothing else. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the life cycle of beads. Um, so Vincent indicated that 95% of the glass in, at least in our collection, kind of comes from Europe, has a European origin. Um, but a lot of the beads themselves were made in West Africa, in these West African countries. Um, Lore showed us two examples of beads that looked identical and were possibly even made in the same workshop, but had different chemical composition um, based on the source of the glass itself. So as those of us who study glass know, a lot of times glass is often made in one place and then kind of worked and transformed into objects in another location. Um, so let's, um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about that sort of circulation, um, a little bit more of those dynamics, what those trades and exchanges look like in your sort of areas of study. Expand on that concept a little bit more. Uh, I can start maybe. Uh, and I can answer to Carrie Sinanas, thanks to her comments. It's related. I agree with what she said. I think West African people and West African beads, yes, uh, I agree. It's probably not because of the, the trade and the slave trade. But uh, in the collection we have in the Corning Museum, maybe there is two time period. You have that 15th, 16th century, but maybe Laura later, she can agree or not, thanks <laughs> to the composition. And uh, so you would see different kind of maybe producer, maybe in that 16th century beads we have in the Corning, they are, um, they are coming from um, West African bead maker. This is the first time period. The second time period we have in the collection, mostly 19th century, 20th century, I agree, it's the life, the, the, the cycle life of beads, it's made of um, like um, recycling the beads. And um, and I think in different technique as well. Uh, maybe we're gonna see that. Uh, I told you they they were making uh, glass powdered powder beads uh, uh, with molds, but we have different kind of mold depending on the on the on the bead makers. You have vertical molds and you have horizontal horizontal molds. So maybe uh, thanks to the chemical composition and the way you can see things lower, maybe we can know more about it as well. Because I heard uh, based on the different uh, researcher, we don't know yet exactly. So maybe we're gonna find more about the life cycle and the analysis. Maybe we're gonna know more, oh, we know it's scrap bottles, but where these kind of bottles are coming from? Can we know that? Is it too complicated, especially in modern types? Mm. So yeah, so. I don't know if I answer exactly of your question, but yes, um, we have different kind of cycle for sure. From what I've read about um, the archeological excavations in Malaysia, it's believed, and I'm sure again, Laura can, can comment on this too. It's believed that the beads were actually recycled pieces of glass from possibly the Middle East. And so this, this glass originating from the Middle East would come and would either break in transit or be brought in broken pieces for the express purpose of making beads. And then um, like I, I showed in the, in the PowerPoint before the different methods for bead making. And so I am hoping that the chemical analysis will help shed light on uh, where exactly the, the glass for these beads was made and um, help us decipher it's the, the, the beads life cycle, not the bead, but the glass, the material, the, the life cycle um, and its geographic travels <laughs> around this region of the world. 
Uh, yes, that's uh, really something that puzzled uh, a lot of us to understand uh, what is the correlation between uh, a lot of uh, uh, shard pieces of uh, uh, glass from the Middle East in some at some South and Southeast Asian site and uh, and the presence of beads. Uh, it's diff it's for certain that some um, colors were not available to uh, or not very or not as available as, as uh, the other color for as, um, South or Southeast Asian bead makers. So that an hypothesis in hypothesis is that they could have used glass. Uh, that was imported to um, to find this color and uh, use it to make glass beads. Um, I just wanted to uh, tell two stories about the life cycle of beads that sometimes can be very, very long. Um, we analyzed um, with my uh, colleague Bernard Gratus some pearl from uh, Paris uh, from the modern period. And among those beads that were consistent with the dating of the site, we found an iron age glass beads that look really nice. And uh, what and as there was no other evidence of Iron Age um, remains, uh, it seems that people have been picking up these very old beads from I don't know where and used it uh, in the 16th, 17th, 18th century with other beads and, um, and giving it a new life. Uh, 100 years after um, it was um, produced. And that's one of the beauty of glass. It can really be as new for so many centuries. And also uh, something I observed in Southeast Asia is that uh, people pick up beads, archeological beads from the ground when they mm. close their field and they make little uh, necklace for their kids because it has a beneficial, they think it's, you know, um, against evil eye and that uh, kind of things. So those beads have uh, also a second life several centuries after uh, being made and used for the first time um, in the 20th or 21st century. Thanks. Um, there's a question in the chat about the washer beads um, that Kristen showed and about the sort of materiality and how they seem sort of ambiguous. And actually, I think this is a, think something we could all kind of talk about a little bit. Um, the sort of different, because we, as we go through and, you know, Kristen and Vincent and I would look at these materials and say, is it glass? Is it not glass? And sometimes it is very difficult to tell. Um, do you want to, uh, Kristen, do you want to start kind of with some comments on that? About sure, kind of what yeah, the other I... materials might have been or why it's difficult to tell? I saw this question and it made me really think about what makes it ambiguous. Um, but I thought of a good example, maybe if you go to the beach and you find a, um, a really worn um, piece of quartz, maybe, or any kind of stone that was a stone and not a glass beer bottle, <laughs> uh, any stone that's been really polished. If you think of it like that, that's maybe how, how I felt in looking at these washer beads. Well, it could be just a nice piece of stone or, or quartz, or maybe it's actually glass. Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> so um, actually, those are very common and they are glass. You could see it if you were breaking one, uh -huh. uh, which you won't, I'm sure you won't be doing, right? But inside it's perfectly glassy and shiny. Uh, why are they looking like that outside? I have no idea, but mm. they can have different composition, but there are those beads that contains more than 10% of copper, which is, which is huge and not necessary. I don't know why they were uh, using that kind of, um, of um, uh, recipe. Uh, you can find them, um, those exactly that you showed, there was uh, right in Thailand, and yes, they are pretty common in, um, continental Thailand. If you look at the work of uh, uh, analysis by Alison Carter, uh, she has picture of them. Um, and so, so they are glass. Um, but I, I understand the confusion. Uh, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't have analyzed them. I wouldn't have known either. That's where my technique is really useful. There's there something. Sorry, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. Uh, there's a there's a the lick test 
<laughs> you can do sometimes not with anything that hasn't been cleaned and I don't know how <laughs> reliable it is, but um, sometimes you can feel with your tongue um, better than with your fingers or look with your eyes. Um, we do that in, in field work sometimes. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking about the glass deterioration panel this morning. I don't know how many folks in the audience uh, were in that, but kind of how this gl glass changes over time um, based on different environmental processes and um, situate circumstances that it's in. And yeah, that that perhaps I often tell people this about the kind of ancient material, the Roman material, that it looked glassier than it does now often um, due to this kind of deterioration over time. Laura, were you going to add something? I'm sorry. No, it would. No, I was. I wanted to say that when you have a mass spectrometer, you don't need to leak your artifact. But, uh, <laughs> um, but what I wanted to say also, I would. I would be very curious to, and we will never know uh, how was were looking those beads right after being made, because yeah, when you, I had the chance to see uh, the inside of those beads, and inside it really looks as yeah, you were, you would have no doubt it's glass. And there's an interesting, um, I would say, and then Vincent, you can, um, I think, think about like the sort of materiality of glass and that it does seem like sometimes the glass is embracing its glassiness and there's no, you know, it, it's valued for that glassiness, for those properties, those things you can really only achieve in glass. I think some of the ones that Vincent showed with the sort of comb decoration and everything, like there's no sort of doubt you can't achieve that effect with anything other than glass. And then sometimes, you know, throughout glass history, we see glass really trying hard to imitate, uh, imitate other materials. And we saw examples of that too. And that happens in uh, beads and um, other glass objects as well. Um, it's just sort of that, that um, flexibility of glass as a material and the different forms it can take on. Vincent? Yeah, to, to, to re reply for uh, of what you said, yeah, in the, I mean, in the West African collection, yes, um, uh, stone beads are imitated, is it glass? And we have a lot of coral beads that actually are glass. And uh, I wanted to add further uh, information because we about circle of beads, circle of life. Um, part of the West African beads, actually, I'm still have problem to identify, is it European or West African? Mm. Because at some point, of course, like, um, people from Venice, people from Europe, they were imitating uh, the glass powder, powder African beads. But even now, it's very difficult to tell. Maybe Laura can tell, but some some specimen, I'm thinking, is it? So it's like always like the you know the eggs and the the chicks. Okay, is it the West African who created this kind of beads, or is it the Venetian? Or so it's very hard sometimes. So. To, to be able to determine the circle of beads is difficult. And furthermore, the more we advance in time uh, in Europe, uh, especially in the Netherlands, Netherlands, Germany, they were imita imitating as well the Italian beads and they were producing African kind of like beads. So it's, uh, it's, it's more difficult sometimes than ancient times in a way. You know. Well, I think um, that's a good note to end on. Um, this sort of this kind of question about imitation and um, circulation, and that you know it's it's a lot often a lot more complex than just one way or unidirectional, and that there are these dynamics of exchange and um, variations in value. Um, and you know, really, we've really just scratched the surface today, um, and. Uh, our work is ongoing. Um, this team's working hard on understanding and uh, piecing together a little bit more about this uh, collection. Um, and we are, uh, yeah, uh, so I guess stay tuned <laughs> through various courting channels. And um, in the coming years, we're really looking forward to both publishing some of this work, um, which is in preliminary stages now, and then also sharing it with our visitors in the galleries uh, with the reinstallation. So. Thanks especially to the NEH grant for supporting this work and for this year's seminar. So thank you, Kristen, Laura, Vincent, uh, for being here with me today. Um, thank you to all of you for your great comments and questions. Um, I hope folks have been following the chat. There's some great uh, discussion as well there and some comments, um, on, especially on Indonesian beads. So hope we all seen those. So. Uh, with that, we'll adjourn. I think there's a final kind of wrap up with Caroline and Fabian um, just in the closing session. So thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks everyone for being here. Thank you. Bye.